let's go to everyone's favorite segment of the week, shall we? It's time for a good old-fashioned Q&A, MMA fans. So we'll do a little here on the front end, Ladies a little rock cold meat sandwich in the middle, the and himself, then Ariel we'll finish Helwani. up on the back end. How about that? Yeah. That sounds like a great plan. Yeah. So when they're cutting this up, they could just ignore that I said all this and put the two parts together. You get what I'm saying? On your feet, because here he is. I get what you're saying. Thanks. All right, here we go. <clears throat> wow, how about this? Uh, I believe this is the first time that this happens. Moderator Lewis, who does such a great job of putting together all the questions. Frank, would you believe it? He's first up. Good afternoon, Ariel. This is from the great Lewis Gilmore. In recognition of the one-year celebration and return of the show... With all that it has brought, I return to the original Ask Me Anything post to find a question that A, was not answered, B, is as relevant now as it was then. I found such a question over to a familiar name, one Troy Farkas, TST, August 18th, 2021. How about that? So I guess we're going back to, oh, so his question, he's not even, he's just... What a mensch. He's just setting up the first question. How about that? That's a that's a great producer moment here from from Lewis, from moderator Lewis. He went back into the archives, August 18, 2021, the first time we ever did on the nose. I don't even think it was called on the nose back then, and got a question from our old pal TST who asked back then, I guess we didn't answer it. When you look back at your earliest days covering the sport and where you are now. In which area do you think you've made the biggest strides? Wow. What a question. Huh. I will say that I feel a lot more comfortable just being myself. I used to feel like every moment of every show needed to be guest, 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 segment, segment. And now, you know, we'll leave 30 minutes open, an hour open, and I don't worry about how are we going to fill the time. I feel very comfortable. And a lot of this came when I was at ESPN. I feel very comfortable just being myself, being a personality who can just rely on himself to fill time, say what's on my mind, not be worried about saying something that might upset someone. If you say something that's with respect and backed by facts, people are still going to get mad, upset, whatever, but... As long as it's not disrespectful, I can live with that. So I feel like developing that voice, feeling comfortable in the chair by myself, so to speak. Obviously, there's other people here, and that's why I love having the other people here because I can play off them and ask them questions and not truly feel alone, but, I mean, sans guess, I feel like it's something that has been developed over time. I feel like uh, as an interviewer, I've gotten better listening, asking follow-ups, being confident, being confident in my skin. But, you know, I still, you know, I say this, but I still feel like there's a ton more to do and a, a ton that I could get better at. Like I could pinpoint five things today that I hated about today's show. And that has nothing to do with the stream, like about my my own quote unquote performance. So we are a long ways away, but I appreciate that. Danny Breezy, my dear friend, Hiawani, our boy Rocky, Finally getting that title shot this weekend at UFC 278. My question is this. What do you feel is the best route for Leon after he defeats Kamaru on Saturday in terms of excitement for the division? Get revenge on Jorge for the three-piece trilogy bout with Kamaru, the fight we have all been waiting for with Hamzad. All good options, but I feel like the buildup for the Leon-Jorge fight would be wild. But does Jorge need a win after three straight dominating losses to justify making that bout? Probably. Would love to hear what you think. All up to the nose. If he fought Jorge, it would be very much like when Michael Bisping fought Dan Henderson after he beat Luke Rockhold. That was a fight where if Rockhold was still champ, Henderson's probably not getting a title shot, but the reason why Henderson got the title shot was because it was a rematch of a fight that happened in UFC 100. And they had a rivalry. So... If they went the Jorge route, which I don't think is a crazy thought, that's the only reason. That being said, I do think it's a long shot. If Leon wins, 
I would say the front runner for his first title defense would be a trilogy fight with Kamaru because Kamaru has been so good because he's won 18 in a row because he's defended the title four times and pound for pound, all that stuff. I'd say that would be number one. If he is not available, I would say if Hamza beats Leon, that would be number two. And then number three would be Jorge. But yes, a ton of possibilities, a ton of options. I saw Dana say that if Leon, excuse me, if Nathan beat Hamza, that he might get a title shot. I was like, man, how's he getting this title shot? Are we just going to ignore the whole contract thing leading up to the fight? Is that just going to be something that we're not going to talk about and pretend like isn't out there in the open. It's not out there in the open. In any event, um, I would say those are the three options. Probably Kamaru trilogy would be at the very top of the list. Usually when a dominant champion loses, they run it back right away. Chasanga, my good friend, one of the best to cover the sport. Happy anniversary, Ariel. My question is this. Will Leon Edwards actually get his flowers if he beats Kamaru Usman, which myself and the great, powerful P.T. Carroll have predicted for the last two years this weekend. Yes, that is true. The MMA community always seems to find a way to rain on his parade. It is a good point. It has been quite the journey for one Leon Edwards, and he has had many a setback, dating back, of course, to what happened in 2019. He gets this big win in London, and all of a sudden it's completely overshadowed by the fact that Masvidal punched him backstage and he never got revenge. And I always thought that that should have been the fight. And they went in a different direction. They went with Askren versus Masvidal. He never got that opportunity. And then, of course, they go back to London the following year. And it's the first event canceled by the pandemic. And he can't seem to get a fight. Um, and then he sees, you know, Colby fight Woodley. Um, <clears throat> and other fight, Gilbert Burns as well gets that opportunity. So he's had some bad luck. Even the eye poke situation didn't do him any good. Even the way he beat Nate and that last minute kind of overshadowing the performance didn't do him much good. Um, but I think if he beats Usman, you know, come hell or high water, he's going to get his flowers. Now people might say, oh, you know, it was boring or eh, he didn't deserve it. You know, there's a million ways. And I agree with the pick. I can't see, I could see Edwards winning, by the way. I can't see him stopping Usman. So I do think that plus 1,000 pick from GC is a worthy pick and a really interesting pick, especially with those odds so crazy. Um, and then when you think of a decision and how good both guys are, is it going to be like a 48-47 where people are talking robbery? You know, you hate to see that. You don't want to see that. So yes, I could I could think of a multitude of ways. But yeah, what a moment, especially for the UK scene, for those that have stuck by him, that have, uh, you know, supported him where it seemed like, you know, there's some guys where it seems like they only have to win a couple in a row and they'll get a title shot. A Yeri Prochaska, two in a row, title shot. Other guys, they've got to do so much. So much has to go their way for them to finally get a title shot. Leon's in that category, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of happy people who will want to celebrate him if he's able to pull it off. Uh, Luis, Luis Diaz. Hey, Ariel, this weekend, Luke Rockhold, excuse me, this past week, Luke Rockhold spoke with CBS Sports's Shaquille Majuri does a great job and referenced two to three managers being in the pocket of the UFC as a contributing factor to fighter pay issues, specifically that they won't speak up. Is he onto something? What's your take on this? Of course he is. And you know who we're talking about, especially one in particular, but there are multiple. There are many managers, I would say, in this sport, and there aren't that many in total, but the vast majority, or I'd say maybe the majority, let's just put it that way, who are more concerned about their relationship with the UFC than their relationship with their clients. What I mean by that is it's more important to be in good standing with the UFC than to fight for certain things that would benefit their client who has five, six, seven years in the organization. <clears throat> and so you'll have you know 80 or so fighters on your roster and it's good to be that factory where you can you know get your guys in and tell them, look, I got you into the UFC and I got you this, I got you that. But ultimately, if you have this cozy, like you obviously want your manager to have a great relationship with the brass, 100%, but not so good to the point where you're like, you know, hanging out and drinking beers together. I wouldn't want that for my manager. I want there to be some, I want there to be a lot of respect, but also a little bit of tension because, you know, when we're, ah, I just poked myself damn in the face. How about that? When you're fighting for something, there's going to be tension. 
Did you guys see what just happened? I had a pencil and I just literally poked myself right in the chin. When there's tension, when you're arguing, when you're, when you're, when you're negotiating, there's going to be tension. But then at the end, you can shake hands and walk away. Um, I think one of the managers that's in a really great spot with the UFC right now is Tim Simpson of Paradigm. I know he battles them, but I know there's respect on both sides. He's not out drinking beers and hanging out with them. There's this mutual respect. They'll battle. They'll make a deal. They'll shake hands and they'll be on to the next. I think that's a very healthy relationship to have. I don't think it's healthy for you to do things like you're working for the company to be a house manager for you to get clients from other managers who can't cut a deal with the UFC and bring them, you know, to the UFC and say, Hey, look, this is what I did. Like, I think that's very unethical to go to someone else who's represented by another manager on behalf of the UFC, who's in not such good standing with, you know, the, the company and try to cut a deal with them and be sent on their behalf as a quote unquote house manager is just not a good place in my opinion. But there's some people who feel like that's the best spot to be in and best for their career and best for their longevity in the sport and all that stuff. Um, but if you're asking me if what Luke Rockhold said is accurate, yes, what he said is accurate. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know that probably pissed you off, Frank, but I couldn't help it. Music it, to my ears. Adriano. Hi, Ariel. I'm a massive Seinfeld fan. Can you just mute this for one quick second? Hi, Ariel. I'm a massive Seinfeld fan, so I always get a kick out of when you try to get the crew into it. Out of everyone you've worked with, I would assume you're Jerry... Who is your George, who's your Elaine, and who's your Kramer? You can also add who would be your Newman. Appreciate everything you do. Congratulations on your one-year return to a platform and stage where you are valued and belong. Wow, what a tough one. Uh, I don't know if I could do that. I would probably say Elaine would be New York Rick, right? Been around together the longest. You know, we've had our... Our, our, our ups and our downs, but like, you know, ride or die, right? I would probably say Newman is Frank, right? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if any of you will even understand these references because none of you watch Seinfeld. I mean, look, there's a difference between watching Seinfeld and like knowing all of the nuance to Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. I'm more in the first category. Oh, you are? Yeah, I mean, I've seen... Shows, episodes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know. George and Kramer. I, I feel like a George. If I you feel like a George? Yeah. All right. I'll give you George. Elaine will be uh, near Crick. I don't know if it's fair to say Connor's Kramer. Although I, I actually feel, I feel comfortable with that. Makes sense. Really? <laughs> yeah. You know, like Kramer's just like, he's always down for a good time. You're down to show up here. You're down to show up there, you know? I, I feel like that's that's accurate. Burst into rooms unannounced, yeah. Yeah. Sure, I'll take it. But this uh, is assuming you are Jerry, right? Who's George's dad? <laughs> <laughs> my my name's it. This is Frank Costanza. Uh my Newman would probably be my arch nemesis, right? Um But I don't have any arch nemesis. I, I feel like I get along with everyone. There's a guy on TikTok that's been like doing modernized versions of Seinfeld. Have you seen my TikTok? Oh, you have one? Killing it these days. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Anyway, you should check it out because he does all the different parts and he does them pretty well, but it's like talking about modern things like, as if the show was still going on. Oh, wow. S speaking of your TikTok, have you seen the uh, the Instagram account Ariel Helwani every day? No. It's a great account. What are you talking about? It are they mocking me? No, it just posts the exact same picture of you every single day. Why? <laughs> How many followers? Know. A million? Two million? Uh, I don't know if it has any. It just popped up. How do you even know this? It popped up on my follower wow. recommendations. You found it's, it? Yes. I'm actually going to follow the it right now. The same picture of Ariel Hawani every day. I'm following it right now. It just went from four followers to five. To five. Oh, wait. We just followed it at the exact same time, so there's actually wow. six followers right now. Six followers. I mean, it's a great account. Shout out to Albert Entity, Jessica Zarco, Parry Punch, Kimish, Connor Burke, Sarah Hawani. Frank, you going to follow it? <clears throat> yeah. How would you even know such a thing? I'm going to like the last one. There we go. 
Shout out to Ariel Hawani every day. What you couldn't have picked a better picture of me? Jeez. It's not one of my best, if I'm being honest. Uh, El Cubano. Hola, Ariel. Happy one year anniversary. Kick and, qu quick and simple this week. If Paulo Costa misses weight again this weekend, how would you handle him moving forward if you were the UFC? Would you let Costa go or keep him but refuse to give him about a middleweight moving forward? I would strongly, strongly suggest that he moves to 205. Remember when they said that he was going to move to 205? That they were going to force him to go up? If he misses weight again, I feel like it's time. He's a character. He's entertaining. Not so reliable. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily get rid of him. But he is one of those guys where it feels like the end is going to come in a very dramatic way. And then he'll be fighting on some, you know, random card somewhere on some stream. Um, I do think like 205 might behoove him. So we'll see what happens on Friday. Hopefully we don't get to that point and it won't be an issue. Uh, Stefan, what's good? Or it could be Steven. You never know these days with the PH. What's good, Ariel? Looking at some potential non-title matchups in the welterweight division this week, I've seen rumors of a Wonder Boy Kevin Holland fight for MSG November. I had a couple questions. How do you feel about this? Don't hate it. Is this another fight where Wonder Boy could get dominated on the ground? Hmm, with Kevin Holland? I don't think so. Or will this be a more exciting performance where both are looking to put on a show? More of the latter. Is Kevin Holland in need of a win over big names like this? Yes. If so, is Steven Thompson the right choice to bolster his popularity and ranking? Sure. I like it. How much longer do you see Wonder Boy competing? One or two more years? Could this be his last fight with the UFC? I think he signed a deal not that long ago. Depends on how it goes, but we're certainly reaching the end. There's no doubt about that. Matt in Montreal. Have you ever wanted to walk away from MMA slash interviewing people? If so, what would you do? Yes, I have thought about running my own promotion. I have uh, long believed that I'm the best promoter in MMA and that I can run the business side of things better than anyone. Um, no, I mean, obviously I've, I've thought, you know, there's a few like bucket list things that I would like to do. And some I've had a chance to do. I got to do sideline reporting, got to do a whole bunch of stuff like host radio, be on sports center, this and that. Uh, I would love just once, just once, if I could put it out there, I would love to be a character on a pro wrestling show. I really think I could be like a really good heel manager. And wouldn't you know it, you know, heel Wani, I mean, I feel like it all kind of flows perfectly. Would love that. That would be great. Um, as far as like my actual job is concerned, no, I'm very happy interviewing people. I, I still really, really love it. Um, are there moments where, you know, you get tired of something or you get a little annoyed about things or less? Yeah, sure. There's ups and downs, but I still feel very interested. You know, I was like considering at one point, oh, would I like doing this exact show, but for this sport or that sport. And I love the Aaron Jeffries of the world and the Rory McDonald's of the world, the Tom Aspinall's of the world. Like I love these characters. I love these stories. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The fights are great. They're entertaining. They're big. You look forward to the thing that keeps me interested, motivated, excited to be a part of this sport, if you will, covering it, doing this show are the characters, are, are the fighters, are the personalities. I think that they're the best in all of sports. And so the fights are are great, but it's the personalities and getting this type of connection with them, interaction with them, that's what makes me still love doing this all these years later. Steve Pitts. <clears throat> ah, thank you for asking this. Hey, Ariel, what do you make of Dana White admitting they should have re-signed Shane Burgos? He said, this was to Kevin Ioli of Yahoo Sports, 100% mistakes were made. A hundred percent. Big mistakes were made over here. In the past, Dana has said he wishes the best for the fighter, but doesn't really comment about wishing they re-signed a fighter. If Dana was more involved, like in the past, so you think he gets a deal done with Shane? Thanks and have a great day. <clears throat> Thank you for that great question, Steve. Um, what a fascinating, I mean, there was a lot in that interview that, you know, we can talk about, and I don't know if anyone else is going to ask about any other parts, but as far as the Shane Burgos comment, to me, it was fascinating for multiple reasons. Number one, here you have, this is akin to the owner of, let's say, an NBA team. And let's say a big free agent walks away. Let's say <clears throat> RJ Barrett walks away and goes to sign with the Chicago Bulls. And all of a sudden, James Dolan is doing an interview. He wouldn't do an interview, but, you know, just stick with me here. And he's like, you know, he's talking to the New York Post. And he's like, yeah, we messed up. We should have signed him. I don't know what happened there. We messed up. That was a huge mistake. I wish him the best, but like, man, we effed up. 
completely throwing his GM under the bus, right? The same thing just happened here. Instead, he was talking about the matchmakers, <clears throat> Sean Shelby and um, Hunter Campbell, who's general counsel of the UFC. That's exactly what was happening here. Now, I go back to what I've said about the business. I don't know what's going on in my throat. <clears> throat> uh, over the last year, he's not as involved as you all think he is. And so, yeah, would the Dana White of 2009 have said this? No. Would this have happened under his watch? No. But when you're throwing 80 as opposed to 98 back in the day, these things are going to happen. And that's not me knocking him. Them's just a fact. This is something he said. He literally said it himself, proving my point. Not as involved, not as, you know, um, invested, doesn't have his finger on the bus because he won, because he got the big bucks, because he made it, he succeeded, he won. That's what I've been trying to tell you guys. This is exhibit 200 of, of what I've been saying. It's an amazing thing. And if I'm Shane Burgos, I'm like, wow, I feel great. I'm getting these types of comments. Dana's saying that we messed up. We should have signed them. There's no hard feelings. And I'm getting paid in PFL way more than I would have gone in the UFC. What a win-win for me. Incredible. But this is just another example. And I don't think that this is the type of comment that would break through into like the general sports. But if an owner said this about his GM who just let a free agent walk away, it's, it's an incredible statement. It's an absolutely incredible statement. It would very rarely happen. I know it may have happened once or twice, maybe a Jerry Jones comment here or there. Jerry Jones works as the GM, but someone may have said it in the past. You don't hear this often. Everyone is in sync. Everyone knows what's going on. And of course, we're talking about 400 versus 15 or 53 or whatever the case is, but you've never heard Dana say something like this before. So yeah, I do think if he was more involved, he would have known about this. And I do think this is an example of him being less involved. Him not knowing about this or him saying that mistakes were made or him saying that we should have you know, done X, Y, and Z is an indication, uh, an admission that he is less involved. He's not getting involved. Like they didn't talk. He, even, even Shane himself said it. <clears throat> he didn't talk to him on the way out. Now, I know there are people out there who are just like full on, you know, you can't say anything critical, anything negative. Who was like, this is Ariel hating again. No, this is Ariel telling you the truth. This is Ariel telling you what the vast majority of the other people covering the sport who want to, you know, get a pat on the back and their great little Zoom interview with Dana White, who won't tell you because they're afraid to tell you this. This is the people who will sit there and let him tell you stuff that are blatant lies that you know our lies, and it'll be like, yup, uh-huh, uh-huh, yup. Oh, these fights are going to be bangers, boss. Boss, these fights are going to be so great. Those Apex fights are great, boss. No, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not being a hater. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm not trying to be anything. I'm telling you the truth. Sometimes the truth is great. 98% of the time, it's can't wait for Leon. Can't wait for this. Can't wait for that. But then 2% of the time, it's like, hey, finger not on the pulse. Throwing 80. Not 98. I'm sorry. One day you may say the same about me. Certainly not now. <laughs> not now. But one day you might say it, and I'll have to live with it. How's it going, Ariel? I work in the world of advertising slash marketing sales where organization and planning is important when it comes to the day-to-day -day part of my job. I've been watching you for over a decade, and I've always wanted to know how you plan and organize your days. I'm sure it has changed Excuse me, plenty over the years with the growth... <clears throat> God, what is going on, Frank? <clears throat> Why are you blaming me for your throat? <laughs> Not blaming, I just, I want to know um, if you had any insight as to what is going on. You sound great. Mm. Um, all right. How's it going, Ariel? I work in the world of, okay, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure it has changed plenty over the years with the growth of your brand. But what does Monday Sunday look like in the world of Ariel Helwani? Congrats on one year of independent Helwani, and thanks for all the content per usual. Whew, Monday Sunday. Um, Monday, wake up, try to go for a little run in the morning. Uh, Monday is when my wife takes my kids to school. If you must know, all the minutia. Then I come here, do the show. Usually get here around eleven thirty. Uh, we do the show. 1 to 5, 5.30. Uh, then I'm very tired afterwards. Go home, have dinner, sit around, 
and uh, start planning for Wednesday. Tuesday, I will usually, um, well, these days I've been doing Tuesday, Thursday at 10.20 a.m. my uh, workouts with my uh, trainer. We've been doing a lot of stuff. I don't want to... I don't want to show you guys the biceps just yet, but like things are happening. Okay. I don't know if you guys know this. Things are happening right here. Okay. Um, I mean, even GC gave me the old FaceTime call yesterday. Tell them, you know, tell them the state that I was in. Go ahead. Tell them. Yeah. When you picked up the phone, uh, you looked like you were having some sort of health problem, a <laughs> stroke. Come on. Uh, is he coughing a lot? Wow. <clears throat> no, one of his eyes was closed and his mouth was all puckered up and he was like, Hey, what's up, man? Okay, so it's funny that you say that about the eye. Uh, that's always been a thing because one eye can't see far, the other one can't see close. So when I'm not wearing my glasses, I actually usually like look at people with one eye open, one eye closed, and people think it's weird. I don't know. Oh, just, okay. So that wasn't related to the workout. Wasn't related to the workout, but I was like sweaty, red, you know, just kind of taking it all in. Had a good workout. We were doing some combos. NBD. Okay. So then I'll do that. Then I'll usually do an interview for the YouTube channel on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, yesterday I spoke to Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins. Nice. Uh, that is going to be out tonight. So stay tuned for that. That's a lot of fun. Prep for Wednesday show, book the guests, uh, reach out to them, remind them, send them the Zoom links and the rundown, um, you know, catch up on anything that I uh, may have missed as far as their career is concerned. Um, La this past year, I was doing a lot of writing on Tuesdays, break from that, uh, hang out with the kids, play sports, play soccer. Uh, my kids are into baseball these days. So that's a lot of fun. Very into soccer. We went to a sports card store yesterday. We bought some soccer cards. That was fun. We went out to eat. That was a lot of fun. Wednesday, same thing as Monday. Try to run in the morning, come here, do the show. Really tired. I've said this to the guys over there. Uh, Wednesday at around like six o'clock, probably my favorite time of the whole week. Because now I'm like, oh, two shows, all right, cool. Thursday, do the workout again. Do my other show, uh, either on Thursday or Friday. Friday is kind of like the easiest day of the week. Do uh, some of my other content, which I can't speak about here. And um, Saturday, obviously, the fight, post-show, then come back Monday. So, yeah, I mean, there's really no true day. Even Sunday, I'm preparing for the Monday show, book the guests, all that stuff. Uh, so there's no day where I feel like the brain is completely shut off, but I feel like the the least stressful days are like Wednesday night and Thursday because then I don't like starting Friday I start to worry about booking the guests. I I, the, I, will, I will say it till the day I am done. The booking of the guests is the most stressful part. Are they going to be on time? Uh, can they do this? Can I get this name? Can I get that name? Can I you know like that's the most stressful part by far of my entire week of anything that I do. Um, and yeah, I feel like it all kind of fits nicely. It's a nice little puzzle. I feel good about things. Uh, Jamal 2020, French fries. What's the best style? Personally, I'm a waffle fries guy. If I'm feeling fancy, I may go for the shoestring variety. GC is probably a steak fries guy because he's from the South and nobody better mention onion rings. Uh, this is a note from Louis. Jamal is slowly becoming the resident food question provider of On the Nose. I'm here for it. All right, GC, what kind of fry guy are you? Uh, steak fries are my <clears throat> least favorite. Wow. Fries, actually, uh, I like it to be more crispy, you know, more fried. Steak fries, you're getting a ton of potato in there. Yeah. Love waffle fries. Grew up on Chick-fil-A my whole life. Love mm -hmm. waffle fries. Shoestring fries. Love onion rings. He said don't mention onion rings. I love onion rings. Really? I used to love onion rings. There was a place in Canada in Montreal called Harvey's. They had incredible onion Ooh. rings. And, and I hate onions, by the way. You were going to say something? No, I was saying, oh, sounds oh, good. A little just, zesty sauce on the side. I just like them. I mean, they're pretty damn good on their own. Um, yeah, you know, I like, by the way, you know, it's a huge thing for me. A huge thing for me are like, you'll get now the the frozen fries, put them in the air fryer. Fantastic. All time move. Have you, tra move. Have you tried? I don't put anything. I don't put oil. I don't put. Yeah, you just drop them in. Just drop them in, press french fries and yeah. 20 minutes later it's like you just went to mcdonald's uh rick says sweet potato sweet potatoes all right i don't mind sweet potatoes i was introduced to sweet potato fries especially with the kids you know you try to keep it a little healthier for them but you can't compare yeah i mean it's give me a, like the shoestring you like couple, shoestring a couple of nice dipping sauces why shoestring i just like the you know like the standard golden not, yeah like a mcdonald's fry. Yeah. i get a ton of hate for this arby's curly fries mm. Wow, 
you like all those crazy ones. What about oh, you, Frank? Love them. I like uh, wedges. Wedges? With, um, Boo. That's like oh, steak yeah, fries. Too much potato going on. And then on. just crap all over it. You're you. kidding me right now. Really? I like wedges with some malt vinegar, salt and pepper. Wow. Lots of pepper. With you on the malt vinegar, great addition to fries. I can't, you're either all in it or you're, you're not. Yeah, I don't know about that. Wedges. In and out fries are also good, though. In and out fries? No. I actually find that okay, in and out again, fries. I'm stating an opinion. Listen, no. in and out fries taste like styrofoam. I actually feel like that's the this worst part of it. doesn't like onions. So you're, what are you doing at in and out anyway? Like, Why not? I can have, I can have in and out without onions. Uh, I, I, I you ever can't. done in and out animal style fries? Yeah. Have onions in them. I've heard about this. You don't like onions. Don't like onions. It explains a lot. Makes me want to... Uh, by the way, Luke Rockhold is at the media day right now. <laughs> I, think he j I think someone was telling Luke to get to the media day. That's who that was. Did you guys get a look behind that? Uh, no, but he, he put us... He stayed connected with him... Uh, us in his pocket for a few minutes. Did you hear anything? No. Oh, wow. But yeah, he was still on the Zoom for a while. That is... Uh, we hadn't disconnected. We might still be in his pocket at the... Oh, wow. Actually, that would have been amazing if he would stream the media day from his perspective on the show. Yeah, sorry, guys. I'm just on the MMA hour. <laughs> yeah. Errol, you got a question? Oh, my. What a move that would have been, right? By the way, could we just talk about like the balls that it takes to speak that way as you are a UFC fighter on a pay-per-view? Like he's literally saying, shut up, Dana. It takes chutzpah. No? I agree. He's got a ton of confidence too. What a guy. The man. Anyway, um, good fry talk. Ahmed. Hi, Ariel. Which of these names will become champion first? Shavkat, Hamzat, O'Malley. Hamza, what do you say, GC? Hamza, for <clears throat> sure, based on his position. I think he gets yeah. a title shot after this night. He's the fight. closest one, right? Yeah. Although O'Malley, if he beats Jan, he's pretty damn close. For sure, for sure, but I, I think it's Hamza. Christian, love the DJ interview. I've missed that man so much. My questions are, how much do you think his departure from the UFC had a direct correlation to the success of the division recently? Eh, maybe a little more parody, but remember, he wasn't the champ. So the same thing could have happened, right? So Hudo, blah, blah, blah. Or was it always heading in the direction regardless? I think yes to the latter. How do you think he stacks up against the elite of the division at this point in his career? He doesn't love cutting that weight as much. You know, at, uh, at one, he doesn't cut to 25. He cuts to 35. But by the way, one thing that I regret not asking him about, we ran out of time, was just like the state of the division now. It's amazing, right? With Moreno and Figueredo and Kaikar France and Askarov and the Matt Schnells of the world, Mateus Nicolau. I mean, there's a lot of guys, so way more options than he had when he was champ. Putting aside his contract with one, does anyone benefit from a DJ return to the UFC? He ain't coming back. I'd be shocked. Jose Massa, as a European... I don't understand professional wrestling. I get that kids watch it, but as an adult man watching a soap opera with fake fighting is beyond me. Ugh, are we doing this right now? Could you explain what is the attraction and if I should watch one fight, what would it be? Are we really doing this right now? Really? The soap opera with fake fighting. You realize that you could say the exact same thing about any movie. I'm assuming, Jose Massa, that you are a movie fan, a TV show fan, uh, I don't know, a fan of books, novel like all of this is quote unquote soap opera fake fighting like you say the same about spider-man you say the same about superman about batman it's all the same now i try to think about what people who say these sort of things like where they're coming from and is it because it's in front of a live audience that it throws you off i recognize what pro wrestling is i recognize that it is scripted that they know who is going to win the matches however the part that i can't come to terms with is not recognizing the incredible athleticism that it takes to be successful in this. The incredible toll that it takes on their bodies when they're going, like those rings are not fluffy. They are not soft. It's pretty much plywood. They are A, incredible athletes. I find it very entertaining. By the way, knowing very well that it is quote unquote fake fighting soap opera stuff. Who cares? That's the part that I can't get over. Who cares? You like TV shows. You like movies. You like comic books. You like novels. 
Those are all quote unquote fake as well. Why doesn't the same thought process apply here? I don't get that. And to me, what got me into MMA was pro wrestling because when I was a kid and I thought it was real, I loved the idea of this guy versus this guy. And when you can have fun in life and suspend disbelief just a little bit and you could say to yourself, you know what? I'm going to just put my feet up, kick back and see who's the better athlete here. How is this going to go? How are they going to write this? Where are they going to go from here? Yes, men and women of all shapes and sizes, of all ages, love soap operas. They've been around for hundreds of years in all different kinds of forms. Why? Because people love stories. They love drama. They love conflict. They love all this type of stuff. And in the world of pro wrestling, they have figured out that bring all those elements, plus showmanship, plus athleticism, plus conflict like this guy is actually going to fight this guy. This is fun. I don't understand why people are so A, offended by this and B, why they just can't get it. Do not appreciate the circus. Do not appreciate theater. None of these things are quote unquote real, right? They're all doing incredible things that you and I, regular Joes and Schmoes can't do. Why can't you appreciate that? Why can't you appreciate that, but also recognize, oh, it's good, but then also enjoy boxing and MMA. I've never quite understood this. It's really amazing to me that I still get these comments. Like these athletes, like the, 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 the best wrestlers in the world do things that I couldn't even dream of doing, that 95% of the world can't even dream of doing. They are insane athletes. And we've had MMA fighters who have gone over to wrestling thinking that it's going to be easy and then come back and say, on second thought, that was way harder than I thought. That is really, really tough. Performing live in front of people like that. You don't get to do it over. You don't get to go cut. Let's do it again. Like in the movies that you love so much that you pay so much, you don't get to, it's all live. It's all in front. That's even more amazing to me. And people just try to shit on it, crap on it. And no one's trying to force it down your, your throat. No one's trying to force it down your throat at all. But yet people want to like crap all over it. Like it's this horrible thing. You know, it's fake, right? You know, yes, yes. I've heard that it's fake. I've heard that it's fake for the last 30 years. Trust me, I'm aware. Still incredibly entertained by it. Still love it. Still appreciate it. Still able to have fun and not take myself so seriously and suspend disbelief and be able to get invested, emotionally invested in the characters and the storylines. And guess what? Let me tell you something. I've been around these athletes long enough. In fact, I was just there backstage, Money in the Bank, last uh, last month in Las Vegas when Liv Morgan, who finally realized her dream of winning the belt, finally got that belt and quote unquote beat Ronda Rousey. And I saw the emotion. She was legit crying. That wasn't fake because what people don't understand is, yes, there is someone in the back who is saying tonight you're going to win the belt. But that is the thing that people like to crap on, right? They like to say, oh, there's someone who decided you didn't really win it. No, that is validation. That is an achievement. That is a signal, a significant moment in your life that someone is saying to you, you have made it to a point where we are going to give you this thing that says you're the top dog and you're going to run with it. They don't give that to everyone. Only one or two people get that at any given point, right? Like Roman Reigns has that right now. He's the guy. He's the guy because he's worked to get to that spot. Just like you are working to get to the spot where you want to be in your company that you work for or in your life, right? Everyone works up a ladder. So that belt signifies that. That belt signifies hard work, dreams, determination, getting crapped on, obstacles. Like how do you not appreciate that? They don't just walk up to the schmo in the back who's the jobber, who's curtain jerking and saying, hey bud, we're going to give you this belt because uh, we decided to, no. They're giving you the belt because you worked your ass off for 10 years and you traveled the roads and you beat up your body and you bled and you sweat and you cried and all this stuff and you finally made it to the point where the fans want you on top and they want to root for you and buy tickets and buy merchandise and buy pay-per-views and all this stuff. That's a huge achievement. You are getting that opportunity and then it's up to you to run with it and then become a star and all this stuff. Like, how do you not appreciate those moments, those human moments? And I get it. It's not everyone's cup of tea. And I understand where people aren't going to be able to suspend disbelief and get invested. But like, to me, the part that really annoys me is when they don't want to give, when these haters don't want to give credit for the athleticism, for the toll, for the work, for the story, for all that stuff. Drives me nuts. Drives me nuts. Do you, do you really, do you really come from a place where you can't appreciate that this guy is doing all this stuff and getting beat up? And as far as the one quote unquote, you have to put a quote unquote fight. You have to put that in there, right? You couldn't just say match. You couldn't just say that. Uh, I mean, there's a million. Go watch freaking 
uh, HBK versus Roman Reigns. He said Roman Reigns versus Razor Ramon. Go watch that. Uh, go watch uh, Owen Hart versus Bret Hart, WrestleMania 10. Go watch uh, Rock versus Hogan, WrestleMania 18. Go watch the TLC. Go watch the TLC match from WrestleMania 17 and tell me that you are not just blown away by what those men did in there. Go watch that. Um, there's, there's a million. Go watch any of them. Any WrestleMania. Go and tell me that you are not blown away by all of this. But you want to get hung up on the fake. It's fake. No, it's not fake. You know what's fake? Uh, the little comic book that you read or the little Harry Potter movie that you like to watch or the little magic cards. That you, that's fake. This ain't fake. All right? Enough with this crap. And by the way, for anyone who gets annoyed of me talking about it, reporting on it, covering it, doing interviews about it, it ain't going anywhere. Love it. I have so much admiration and respect and of course, I'm not watching everything. I'm not sitting there watching every show. All, But like, they are incredible people, incredible guests, incredible people to talk to, interviewees. Um, and I love the business. I, there is no MMA if there wasn't a pro wrestling long before. Mark my words. There is no such thing as something called MMA if there wasn't something called pro wrestling beforehand. That's a shoot. And if you don't like it, I got two words for you. Ryan. Hi, Ariel. Ryan from Australia, just a few things. You've said a few times now PFL is the number two brand. Do you think they should make brackets bigger because having two fights, then finals doesn't seem like enough? Potentially, Rory won one, lost one, and was the number one seed. Yeah, I've thought about that. But at the end, it's like four or five fights in a year. Tough to get more than that, right? But yes, I've thought of that. David, hi Ariel, what's the latest on Carlos Sparza? What's more likely for her next title defense against Zhang Weili, November 12th at MSG or December 10th? I could tell you this, Frank, hit the breaking news. Thank you. The plan right now is for that to be on the MSG card. And I saw someone saying, I don't know if it's going to pop up, Ariel, ew, why don't you break news like you used to, like Brock Lesnar? Where are you people? I mean, just because I'm not doing it in one specific spot, don't get it twisted. I'll break news all I want. I'll run circles around everyone. I don't need to go chase it and beg for it like I used to. But let's not forget who broke the Chandler and uh, Poirier thing and all the other stories over the past year. Come on. Still here. Doing it in different ways. Don't really care to go breaking Colon, blah, blah. And by the way, I'm not crapping on that. That's, you know, something that was great for me that got me in. But the problem is, the pro this is the problem. The problem is the UFC puts the fear of God in these poor managers and tell them, if you tell anyone, if you tell anyone about this, we will cancel the fight. This is what they say. We will. This is what I had to deal with with three years, for three years. We will cancel the fight if you tell Ariel about this. We will cancel the fight. Can you believe that? Meanwhile, I have always been an advocate, and I've said it many times before, let the fighters break their own fights. Let them put out their own graphics, their own videos. I love when I see like Kevin Holland do it or Sugar Sean O'Malley. Why do they care so much? I have no idea because A, they want to use these little fight announcements as these little things to get people, you know, to curry favor. And B, they want to put out like a little social media graphic. I would say they could still put out the social media graphic because when they make it official, it's sort of like when Woj breaks a news story or Shams or Schefter or whatever, and we could get into how that all works, but like they break it. And then when the team makes it official, it still get a gazillion likes and retweets and all that stuff. No one cares. No, it doesn't matter who broke it. It really doesn't. You'll get attention here and there. Most people won't credit you and everyone's, you know, moving on to the next thing. But anyway, the plan is for it to be the co-main event on uh, November 12th. It's just not a done deal yet because they're waiting to see if uh, both participants can make that date. There's a couple of hurdles, but that's what they want. They want it to be on the MSG card November 12th. That's what they want. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but that right now is what they have penciled in. Carla versus Zhang, November 12th. MSG. And yes, it's true. They would say, we'll cancel the fight. They've never actually canceled any fight. Uh, it's just like a crazy threat and was a part of a whole long chapter that I'm going to do one day in my soon to be critically acclaimed book, Memoir. Highway to Helwani. Will you buy it, Frank? Of course. Hello, Ariel. This is from Matan. Time for you to spill the tea. On another show, 
a certain agent mentioned that there were rumors of Bellator trying or in the process of being sold. So what is the scoop? I have not heard that at all. I've heard that there might be some changes, this, that, and the other, but I have not heard anything. This is Malky. Malky said this uh, to me, and uh, I have not heard that they are trying to sell them, that Viacom is trying to sell them or that they're on the chopping block. But I will say, like, I, I do feel like the Aaron Jeffrey win over a guy like Austin Vanderford, who just fought for the belt, should feel like a bigger deal. And I think what Platinum Perry was saying, there is some truth to that. Like, Bellator needs to get on track here. I feel like they need a kick. They need a kick in the balls. They need something. Maybe it's Sabatello and Stotts. Like, there's something that is missing there that was there a couple of years ago and that was definitely there in Strike Force. And I'm not quite sure what it is and how they get that magic back. But uh, I, I personally have never been a huge fan of the name or the logo. Um, I don't know what it is, but it feels like there's something missing there. Do you know what I'm saying, GC? There's something missing there. What is missing there? You tell me as an outsider. Something is definitely missing. As someone that attended an event just a couple months ago, it feels like something's missing. Something's missing, right? Yes. It just like, why, why doesn't it feel feel bigger about about that upset now he's talking about he could potentially be fighting for the belt but it, it, johnny eblin is like exhibit a thousand right like that should have been a big deal should have been a huge deal he essentially embarrassed musasi in that fight and it felt like no one talked about it hmm. yeah i don't i don't get it there's just there's like an energy there's an energy that's missing there's a buzz that's missing and i you know I, I would say the 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 events. I'm not, you know, they're just lacking a little bit, right? Like the main event this past, like, he, he, you know what? I was actually thinking about this. You know what's missing? What's missing are, are the stakes. What do these fights mean, right? At least with Bellator, you know. Excuse me, with PFL, you know. All right, I know that if Chris Wade wins on Saturday, he's going to the finals, right? I understand that. I can latch on to that. I could build that up. UFC obviously is a little murky, but they're the UFC and it's the best of the best. And they don't necessarily have to make things as, as clean. What are they fighting for? What are the stakes? Now they're trying with these rankings, but like what does an Aaron Jeffrey win over Austin Vanderford truly mean? I don't know. What are the stakes? What's happening? I think that's what's ultimately missing. What are the stakes? What do these fight? What does Goichi Yamauchi's win actually mean? What does Ali Malay McFarland's win mean? The stakes. Explain it to us. Make it feel important. Jordan. Hey, Ariel. Also, they, I think they have to do a better job of building up the talent. Like, we shouldn't find out about Aaron Jeffrey after the win. We should find out about him before the win. Now, how do you do that? You know, it's it's work. It's social media. It's YouTube. It doesn't come easy. With Rory McDonald retiring, Aaron Bronstetter said it is the end of the golden era for Canadian MMA. GSP, Rory, Cote, Hominick, do you agree? Yeah, I do. There was a great run there. What is the current state of Canadian MMA, in your opinion? Any notable names that could carry the torch? There are some. Mr. Jeffrey could be one. Um, Michael Malott. There aren't a ton, I will be honest. I do think that something that is missing right now is the regional scene. The regional scene in Canada used to be tremendous. You had things like um, Maximum Fighting Championship and the Score Fighting Series and obviously TKO. Um you had promotions in BC all the way to Quebec. Uh, you don't have that as much. I know there are some here and there, but you don't have that as much. This is a rebuilding phase, no doubt about it. And you know, certain figures will pop up here and there. And there, you know, there's the Charles Jordanes of the world. There, there's the Yamanza hobbies of the world. Um, but I don't see a GSP and I don't see a Rory, and that's a bit of a bummer. But, you know, there's always going to be, you know, like Irish MMA was on fire and then there's a down period. Obviously, Canada way bigger than Ireland. But the point is, it's not always going to be. There was a point where Brazilian MMA wasn't great. So I have no doubt that it's going to come back. And I think more shows in Canada, more regional shows would certainly help develop that uh, that new breed. But I, I'm actually starting to feel now like there's a nice crop of young. Like two years ago, I felt like there was nothing going on. Now I'm starting to feel more and more like there's a nice crop of young talent coming up. So here's hoping, but I agree with Aaron's statement and it's a bit of a bummer and I'll always love those guys. 
Justino, Ariel, I'm currently in the hospital because my wife has just given birth to our first child. Frank, breaking news. Congratulations, Justino. And while we're talking about childs or children being born, uh, how about a hearty mazel tov breaking news for our own Shaheen Al-Shadi, who became a dad yesterday as well. Congratulations. So yes, to him and his wife. Beautiful stuff, beautiful photos. Very, very happy for him. Um, and, and happy for you as well, Justino. I know becoming a dad was a really huge deal and something that Shaheen wanted very, very much. And uh, I couldn't be happier for him and wish the best to, to him and his wife. Um, back to the question. So I figured what better time to ask the GOAT of MMA coverage a question with all the talks of Steve Ann Jones fight being for an interim belt. I haven't heard a ton of that talk, but fine. And the winner, of course, fighting Francis. How do you realistically see that going? I mean, I think it's still up in the air. As I said on Monday, uh, wouldn't it be surprised if they try to get Francis to fight John the Francis thing doesn't work out. Then they try to do Stipe Jones and they try. I think it could end up being Stipe Jones for the interim belt, but that situation is way too fluid, way too developing for me to predict at the moment. But this is what they want. They want John on December 10th. They do want John on December 10th. And I think in a perfect world, they would want John versus Francis. I don't know if that's going to work out. Uh, Nick. Hey, Ariel, you are often asked for journalism advice, but I want to flip a script a little, the script a little. Tomorrow I have the opportunity to be the guest on a local radio music show. Can you offer some pointers on how to be a good guest interview? I know the basics. Be friendly, be authentic, be prepared with a couple of interesting stories. Anything less obvious? When you have a first-time guest, what do you hope for them from them? Um... That's a great question. Be fun. Be entertaining. I feel, dare I say, can I say this, guys? Can I give myself the old Barry H? Say it. I feel like I'm a great guest because I know what I want out of a guest to be great, right? So if you just sit there with short answers, boring answers, uninterested, all that stuff, eh, no one's going to want you back. But I want someone to be like, damn, that was a great spot. Like, I know what a great spot is, what a great guest is, who a great guest is, what it takes to be a great guest. So you have to have energy. You have to be fun. You have to be invested. You have to be excited. You have to be energetic, all that stuff. Bring it. Now, a lot easier, in my opinion, to be a good guest as opposed to a good interviewer, because there you're just sitting back and you, just, blah, 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 you crack some jokes. And it's always fun to break the fourth wall, have a little fun, be a little heelish, if you will. Just have fun with it. Why are we whispering? I'm not sure. Um, all right. Last one, Ben Curtis. Hey, Ariel. First time asking a question here, but I have been listening to the show for a while now. My question is for the whole crew, including anyone else behind the scenes who wants to answer. As the one-year anniversary for this show has just recently passed. And by the way, one year since we came back, but let's not get it twisted. We've been going since 2009 with this particular show. All right. So like, you know what I mean? It's like 12 years, one year. Uh, what has been the greatest, best thing that has resulted from your involvement with the MMA Hour? So again, are we talking past year? Or are we talking past, you know, 13 years? I'm not sure. Frank, why don't you go first? I have found um, watching MMA to be quite fun. Hmm. Did you ever watch an MMA fight? One fight. The one where, um, is it Weedman? I don't know why I oh, can't God. get it. All right, don't do this to me. <laughs> Someone got their leg broken. Oh God, that one! Finding a kick, yeah. Why that one? That w I mean, just some friends showed it to you. We're like, wait, hey, come over. We're was it Weidman getting his Weidman. leg broken? I don't yeah, know why but, I said Weidman. I know Weidman. That's why. But was it like because he's been in that situation? He was Twice, on the receiving right? end. Yeah. Yeah. No, this was um, was it Silva that he was fighting? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Back Silva to the day. broke his leg, mm -hmm. and there were some people who were like, "We're doing a pay per view. You should come over." I did that. Watch that. That was the only fight. That I wow. Watched. Okay, so what's the best thing? Like, just that you love... I just said that now I, I'm, like, watching it more on the regular. Now you're, like, freaking killing it. Just doing picks Cheeto, left and right. Cruise, yeah. Yeah. What about you, GC? Uh, 
Side note, how many drinks do you have back there? A lot. We just took a like lot of four different <laughs> sips, you know, consecutively. Every time you went to take a different sip, it was a I different got this. Drink. I got the orange juice. You just, yeah, you just. I got the water. water. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very. It's the orange stupid. juice that probably did your throat in. You, th- you yeah. know what? The pulp killed me, right? Yeah. Highly acidic. I kept thinking it was like a, when you were sipping it. I kept thinking it was like a, it looks like a fireball shooter with the red top and everything. You took mm. both kids' water bottles. Yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm, I'm a mess of a situation. Um, I got this, you know, on my way from the uh, the Black Fox coffee shop. Shout out to them. That's I a great this. spot. I went there for the first time. Did you last go? Week. You did. Yeah, you got you got the you got the cappuccino. No, I got the uh, the butterscotch latte. Butterscotch latte. What the hell is that? I mean, it's a latte with what butterscotch syrup flavoring. Yeah, it was mm. good. It was good. You went before the show. Uh, last week I did. Yeah, it's the best. Their food's pretty good too. It's a, it's a nice spot, too. We used to have one here in the building. I know. We talked about this. Anyway, place, yeah. I got this because I thought maybe it would give me some energy. Long show, a lot of guests. I think we had eight people on the show today, right? If you, Yeah, eight people. So, you know, but you're right, Frank. Why do you, th- why do you think this did me in? Well, you should only drink orange juice to fend off scurvy. What? Um, and then <laughs> the pulp <laughs> is what got in your throat. <laughs> and you shouldn't the, do that before the, the show. The pulp, 100%. You know what? I'm done with that. And didn't Billy Corgan tell you anything yesterday about vocal performance? or Tonight. Okay, no. no. <laughs> I can't answer the question. <laughs> By the way, uh, the DraftKings page is up on my screen right now, and like a bunch of fights just flashed. What does that mean? Does that mean the odds just changed? Yes. Yeah, they do that. Wow. I think Aldo flashed. Plus 115, Uh-oh. is that accurate? Yeah, that would mean he's becoming even more of an underdog, despite it wow. seeming like everyone being on him. Weird. Anyway, what's your pick? Uh, probably with Frank, you know, I, I love like diving super deep into uh, into being an MMA fan, but favorite actual moment, hitting the air fryer, bringing the air fryer in, enjoying some chicken nuggets on the show, and the highlight of that was... You actually believing the crunching sounds were real. Oh my god, that was, that was great. an all time moment. Yeah. Cooking wow. with milk too was pretty sick. Anytime we get great. food involved, you nailed it. That that is definitely we get food involved. Too. Yeah, that is definitely the uh, the high point of your past year. I mean, it's just been great. It's been great to have new characters, and there's a lot of people back there, by the way, that we don't hear from. We we don't hear that much from uh, Joe. Hugh was also pretty cool. Oh, the when you uh, just the, went off on how they were talking smack on the other. That show. was big, right? That was like right that at was, the beginning. Yeah, that was right at the beginning. I was like, I, I guess I don't know Ariel as well. Yeah, I, I didn't really it. know what to think then. I was like, oh, this guy's. We were pretty. Angry. Were you guys thinking like I was crazy? I mean, yeah, every time you, you know, that's where the Frank, you know, oh here he comes, here he comes, joke stems from. Right. I every was time scared. you walk up to lunch. We'd be like, oh, we got to quiet down. This guy's crazy. You guys really thought I was crazy. Joe, while you were going off, I'm like, what's up with this guy? What's up with this dude? I mean, you're walking in to hit him up by Tupac. I know, it was freaking fire. I remember there was one time I was at uh, my kid's soccer on a Tuesday, and I was watching this one clip of them talking about, like, oh, he's banned in uh, Vegas and all this shit. And, like, I was freaking, I I could, like, if I was doing a show that day, I probably would have said a lot worse. Um, Yeah, it was fired up. I, th- I think I think we got our point across, right? Yeah, I mean, all kidding aside, I loved it. Thank you, I appreciate that. It was amazing. <laughs> it was a good art, <clears throat> you know. But, you know, not a lot of people taking shots since then. Am I wrong? I mean, I guess you got jabrones here and there with their little, like, YouTube page with three subscribers. But, like, I mean, uh, talking about, like, notable people, right? Did you just take a shot to describe how there's... I don't know shots uh, yeah. taken at you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a time. What else? You guys got anything else? Or Rick coming back. That was fun. Oh, yeah. Rick coming yeah. back was a huge surprise. Yeah. A lot of people that were was... asking about that. I mean, this time last year, I did not know Rick at all. That's true. Never even met him, right? Never met him. Yeah. Um, There's too much. It's been a whole year, which is insane. Oh, Corporate Alex says, my pick would be on the nose. So much I never knew about you despite years working with you. It's amazing. Okay, how about that? Well, that's heartfelt. That's heartfelt. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Typing feverishly three feet away from me. Installing Who? a mute button. Under Alex, the desk yeah, there we go. go. Another <laughs> emoji. <laughs> uh, we've, oh, tons of emojis. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, we've we've done a lot. And uh, I, I think the best is yet to come. Like the great, is it Frank Sinatra who once said? The best is yet to come. No. Yeah, that's it. No one asked me about the fighter pay stuff from yesterday. Can I just quickly touch on that before we go? No one 
no one uh, yeah, has my it. permission. <clears throat> First of all, I saw some people saying, do you think that uh, ESPN is going to back Ramundi, who Dana was talking about in that interview with Kevin Ioli about the fighter pay stuff? And of course they're not going to do. I mean, like the guy called me a douche when talking about the Gina Carano situation. What are they going to do? They're not going to do anything. And I don't think he actually said him by name. So there's the out. Second of all, this is classic in that deflect from the actual issue at hand and just crap on the media, the journalists. Oh, I was just kidding around. I was just kidding around. There is enough that we know, and I think my good friend John Pollock put this uh, perfectly on Twitter. There's enough that we know about the business, about what the fighters make and don't make, that you know, I think we can have educated conversations on the state of the business. And there's a reason why they get so defensive when you talk about this, because they know deep down that this is an incredible deal, that they're making more money than they've ever made before. They're selling out. The pay-per-view is great. The merchandise is great. The sponsors are great. Everything is great. And they get annoyed when, how dare we talk about this? But it's only, I would say, speaking for myself, out of love and admiration for these great fighters who gave us this, this great entertainment. I make no money off of this. I have no skin in the game. We're doing the show if they're making 10 and 10 or 100 and 100. And so it just always kind of, I always laugh when I see this because it's just a way to deflect. Dana White had a crazy rant on the media again. The same type of rant that we've heard for 10 years, but never actually addressing the issue, never actually talking about the issues that the likes of Luke Rockhold or anyone else is going to bring up. And by the way, that comment or those comments that he made to GQ, which I didn't find them to be like comedic or anything like that. They were comments from the president of the company talking about fighter pay. They chose the question, by the way, from an account that didn't even exist. They created the account. Chad Dundas found this out. He just put in the account. It was just a brand new account that was made on, you know, June something 2022. So they chose that. They, they like that wasn't something that was asked at a press conference. They picked the question, they picked the topic. And then you're going to get mad when people write stuff based on your comments. By the way, he loves to bring up this thing where it's like, oh, the media like to write articles based off of interviews that I do with other people. Yeah, you're the most important guy in the sport. You're the face of the UFC. If you say something that is noteworthy, why wouldn't they write off of it? Like, that's. That's a testament to the spot that you're in. Why would why would we just ignore it? Why would we not talk about it? I'm not the one writing the articles. I'm not doing that. But like, why would you think that people would ignore it? You're doing interviews, media. People are going to watch this stuff. You say something that's noteworthy. No difference than a politician saying something to CNN and someone else writing about it, or an actor saying something to Entertainment Tonight. It's like that's how this all works. That's not a, a, an indictment on the media. You're a public person saying important things, noteworthy things to the media. Other media, they're allowed to talk about it. They're allowed to write about it. They're allowed to document it. That's, that's journalism. That's okay. Now, is it better if they said it to you? Great. But guess what? He ain't talking to everyone. So take what you can get. The days of the scrums where everyone was asking questions and all that stuff, not exactly here as much as they were. Now, I know he does the press conferences and all that, but though you remember, there was the press conference and then there was the scrum and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. Point is, don't be fooled by the deflection. That's all. And ultimately, people can say what they want about you know the state of fighter pay and whatnot. What I just find most comedic is, it's always a deflection. It's always just talking about how stupid this guy is, what kind of a scumbag this guy is, all this like vitriol and animosity and hatred about people just doing their job like everyone else in this in this sport, doing their job. It's this whole big hamster wheel. You know, without the media back in the day, you know, and Dana himself has said it, on the UG, the media kept the sport alive on the internet, but now the media, they're the enemy and they're the scumbags and they're this and they're that. Everyone had a part. And of course, more people invested, the Fertitas invested money, all this. Everyone had a part. Now the media are the bad guys. We've been the bad guys for 10 years. It's cool. But don't be blinded by the deflection is all that I will say. 
If if you think like you sit there and 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 you hear Dana talk about boxing, boxing is dead. Meanwhile, Anthony Joshua and Alexander Usyk are going to make more money than you know the entire roster on Saturday. Meanwhile, Tyson Fury and Dillian White made more money than the entire roster. Tyson multiple times more money than the entire roster, and and the likes of George Cambosis and the likes of Devin Haney and the likes of Tank Davis and the likes of Ryan Garcia and all these dudes. Uh, they're making a lot of money. And then you have Tyron Woodley and Ben Askren going over to box a YouTuber. And they're saying they're making more money doing that than they're doing. Like, again, don't be blinded by the deflections. Don't be blinded by any of this stuff. Um, your favorite fighter, Aurora McDonald, probably didn't get what he was owed deserved. Does that mean he walks away with his head down? No, he's happy. He's content. He has memories. It was his decision. Whoops. There's my text. Uh, do you like my text sound? It's a weird I, I one. I was confused for a second. Yeah, it's a weird one. But don't be blinded by the deflection. They'll never present you with anything that says, hey, this was our revenue. This is our fixed revenue. This is our pay-per-view revenue. This is what we make from the TV deals. And this is the cut that they get from that. And this is what we make from Venom. They'll never present any of this. None of this will ever be made public, at least right now. And it hasn't. They'll never just, and, and now you figure it out and you, and we make all our fighter pay public and we make all this. No, what they'll do is sign people and they'll have a deal on the side so that this person doesn't know. And they'll do this deal and they'll do that deal and they'll cut this crypto deal. And then, like, come on guys, you know, what's up. I know what's up. We all know what's up. We still love it. We still watch it. I'll still be here on Monday. I'm still talking about the UFC 98% of my freaking week doing 14 hours worth of shows on it. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things that could be better for the fighters. Don't be blinded by the deflection of the fighter, the, the media are the scumbags, and we don't know what we're talking about and all this stuff. Just ask the fighters themselves. They'll tell you. They'll tell you.